about biamping, which is um, a subject that I think we haven't really covered before, have we? Maybe by wire. I don't know if we have. Anyway, we've now moved our location to yet another engineering desk. This is the actual desk of our chief engineer, Bob Stadther. And Bob's been with us for a long, long time. If you look at PS Audio's grouping, there are more engineers here, I think, than any other of our um, personnel. So we're a very engineering-oriented company. But I don't know how many of you have ever seen one of these. Um, it's a Tektronix circuit computer. Uh, it's kind of cool. Bob keeps it around. It'll show you, you, you it's kind of like a slide rule where you can, um, you can move this around and get different results. It'll tell you, um, oh, um, how to calculate uh, capacitance and uh, Henry's of reactants and um, like right here is time constants and Anyway, it's, it's, you don't see these very often, and most of us just use calculators. And, of course, one of these little guys for measuring stuff. All kinds of good stuff. All right, here's even a digital version of the calipers. Um, anyway, my amping. Let's go to uh, Taylor in Stratford, Ontario, Canada. And it says, is there a real benefit to bi amping with passive speakers? Now, I know there are probably a number of you that don't even know what biamping really is. So let's, let's talk about uh, that starting at the beginning. What, what is biamping? So to biamp means to use bi, two, to use two amplifiers on one speaker. Sometimes you will see loudspeakers that on the rear have twin binding sets. And one is for the tweeter and the other is for the woofer. And a lot of times they'll have little gold straps that connect the two, so you can plug one amplifier in and um, access both at the same time. Now speakers, passive speakers, as he's referring to, internally have passive crossover networks. So a simple passive crossover network would be a capacitor, a single capacitor, Bob's got everything on his desk, so why not? We've got all the props we want. Um, here's a capacitor. What is this? This is a, ooh, yep, it's a 10 mic, 400 volt capacitor. So, and this is called a film capacitor. That's why it's so big. Is there an electrolytic? Like here's a small one. Uh, eh. Okay, I don't see an electrolytic. Well, here. This one is, here, see this little guy? That little guy, it's low voltage, but that little guy is 100 microfarads. This is 10 microfarads. Look at the, look at the difference. So this is a film and foil capacitor that we might use in a high-end application. And, and this is a, um, uh, an electrolytic. And usually a 100 microfarad electrolytic is maybe about that big. But I hope I'm not causing any grief here. Anyway, so we might use this capacitor in series with a tweeter. And, and the way this works is a capacitor is a device that passes AC, which is a musical signal, is AC, okay, alternating current. And that AC is then frequency dependent, right? So this will pass AC. It won't pass DC. We use it to block DC, battery voltage. But when we use it in an AC application, this device... Um, will only pass, de depending on some factors, um, certain frequencies. So in this case, let's say a 10 microfarad capacitor, if we hooked it up to an 8 ohm tweeter, it's going to pass pretty much everything from a certain frequency up. Okay? And that's because it's, it's forming a high pass filter. So the highs are passing and the lows are not. A low pass filter does the opposite. So this in series with a tweeter, ground here, tweeter here, signal coming in, it's going to pass everything above a certain frequency. And in a simple formula, 1 over 2 pi RC, um, will give you that crossover point, right? And 2 times pi times the resistance 
which is the eight ohms of the driver, and the capacitance in, in farads, okay? And that'll give you, I don't know what that is, but whatever it is. Let, let's call it one kilohertz. So everything below a kilohertz is going to start rolling off in, with one capacitor at 6 dB per octave. So at one kilohertz, let's say it, it, it's rolling off, that's its 3 dB down point. It's, so it's three decibels down at, at that frequency that we've set, depending on the size of this cap. Bigger cap, lower frequency, smaller cap, higher frequency. And as um, it goes down an octave, so an octave is doubling the frequency, so from 1,000 to 500, we're going to be now 9 dB down, uh, because it's 6 dB, the 3 dB plus the 6, and now at the um, a, a, another one, uh, 250 hertz, we're going to be, you know, 12 dB down, and like that. So, and if you have multiple capacitors, you can get different slopes, but that's not important. For, for the woofer, we want to do the opposite, right? Here we want to have a low-pass filter because we don't want the woofer to go too high. And we don't want the tweeter to go too low, right? So between those two, we have, you know, these elements of maybe a resist, uh, a capacitor, a couple capacitors, and an inductor. Inductors do the opposite when they, they don't like high frequencies, but they do like low frequencies, where capacitors don't like low frequencies and they like high frequencies. So using a combination of inductors and capacitors, we can build a crossover network for our speaker. Now, if we divide that up so that the, the, this cap for the tweeter goes to one set of binding posts and the inductor and all the other stuff for the woofer go to another set like that, then we can separate them and have one power amp on the base and one power amp on the tweeter or the mid-range or tweeter mid-range, right? But let's just say tweeter and woofer. To do that, we're bi-amping. We're using two amplifiers where formerly we had one feeding both, okay? Now, the important thing with bi-amping is that you need to make sure at a minimum that both of the amplifiers are at exactly the same gain, unless you have a custom speaker of some kind, right? So an amplifier from company XYZ may not have and probably doesn't have the same gain as another amplifier from, a, a, you know, from YZX company. Isn't likely to have the same gain, so you probably want to stay with the same uh, gain. So let's, uh, same company. Let, let's say that you use two of our uh, monoblock amplifiers. We make a, a thing called the M700, the Stellar series, and each of these monoblocks are about 1500 a piece. If you use two of those, they are, of course, identical gain, and we feed one signal from a Y connector into both inputs, and then the outputs, one goes to the tweeter, the other goes to the woofer. The idea here, and the reason that people buy amp, is to make sure that the amplifier is only handling one set of frequencies and not the other. There can be advantages to that. It can sound better. What I would question in most instances is the actual need for doing it and how you might be better off doing something else. For example, um, the, uh, if, if you were to build a system based on the M700, you'd have four M700s in your system and you'd be up there at about $6,000. For that, you could buy, well, you'd come close to buying a BHK uh, uh, Stereo 250, which is better than four M700 monoblocks, just for example. So there's a whole bunch of thought processes that have to go into this, like why do you want to do this? What are the speakers that you're doing it to? How complex are their crossover networks, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of stuff to go through to try and figure that out. Trial, um, uh, you know, going with a company like us that gives you an opportunity to take them home and try them for a month. Um, we, we pay the shipping to you and, 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 and back, in the United States anyway. So, you know, with a company like us, you can take it home and try it. See which one works best. Because there is... There are no hard rules that go with this. It's just and when you get down to that, you got to try it out for yourself. Hope that helps. Thanks. Mm -hmm.